ladies and gentlemen. I'm Lee Suk Chung, uh, teaching at Song Yungan University. I'm very pleased and honored to moderate the session with uh, uh, Dr. Hamley and Dr. Kennedy. Um, as uh, the, uh, the President Park in Gook has introduced uh, Dr. Hamney, he served at the CSIS, uh, well-known global think tank, of almost two decades as the president of CSIS. I guess uh, you are kind of one of the uh, longest uh, CEO of American think tanks. <laughs> I remember one who served Brookings and then, and, and several, but, but very, very uh, rare. So that tells you uh, how uh, excellent his leadership in uh, serving CSIS and also the think tank community in Washington, D.C. It also mean I can't get another job. <laughs> okay, you cannot get another job, all right. <laughs> all right. Um, uh, today, uh, our, his lecture was titled In Search of a Durable Strategy to Guide Iraq-U.S. Relations. But I think you heard not only North Korea, uh, you heard a lot about China. So before we get into uh, the, the discussion session, I'd like to invite Dr. Kennedy at CSIS and he's going to talk about uh, China's business and economy to supplement Dr. Hamlet's lecture. Please. Okay. All right. Um, thank you very much. I'm wondering if we've got the slides ready to put up on the screen. And um, um, I want to thank uh, uh, the Che Institute for in inviting us uh, in Chairman Park. And, and everyone for, for coming today uh, to have this conversation uh, for us to work together to solve uh, and address these problems uh, that Dr. Hamry uh, outlined. Uh, I want to say uh, also thank you to Dr. Hamry for uh, letting me uh, come with him on this visit. Uh, I've, this has been tremendous. Uh, and um, we at CSAS are amazingly lucky to have him. Um, we were really worried earlier this year, and by the grace of God, by the grace of good doctors, uh, by his own strength, uh, we, we've gotten some good luck. A, a year in which there's been other troubles, but I think uh, we can say uh, for CSIS it's been a critical turning point for us, and so uh, we're looking forward to continuing to collaborate with Dr. Hamry for a long, long time. And. Um, you know, I first came to Korea in 1993 when I worked for a different uh, think tank down the street from CSIS, uh, the Brookings Institution. And in 1993, when I came here in the summer, uh, Korea had just established diplomatic relations with China. Uh, and China was very popular here. You couldn't turn in any direction without running into a Chinese restaurant. And uh, there was great optimism about the relationship. Uh, 26 years later, I think the thinking about China has changed somewhat. The economies are much more integrated, but the concerns are a lot higher than they were uh, in 1993. Uh, let's see if I can push this slide. Super. So I'm going to control. Is it okay if I use? Can I control it from this? Okay. Super. Okay. So these. I wanted to. What I wanted to do is just identify some takeaways that I heard from Dr. Hamry's speech, and put them in the context of some of the challenges and opportunities that we face uh, with China. Uh, the first, uh, and the big theme of his speech is how important the U.S. ROK alliance is, not only for issues on the peninsula, but uh, because of China, that larger strategic challenge that we face. As a result, uh, a secure, democratic, and prosperous Korea is critical for the United States and for the world. Um, and managing China and this challenge isn't going to be easy uh, for lots of reasons. Uh, the first is uh, domestic politics. You may have noticed the U.S. has some... Uh, uh, disagreements in our domestic politics about lots of issues, including how to manage China. And finding a coalition that can work together is a cha challenge. In addi addition, it's also challenging because 
even though there's lots of difficulties with China, we have lots of benefits in our relationship. And so managing that complexity in and of itself is hard, regardless of domestic politics. Um, so we face economic challenges with China, national security challenges, uh, issues of values in our systems, what I call a conflict of systems. Let me briefly just elaborate on what those are, uh, just two of them. Um, the first, uh, I think everyone has heard of Made in China 2025, and China's effort to use state power and funds to promote China moving up in every area of advanced technology you can think of. This is just a very short list of China's very ambitious plans. Uh, you would think uh, one example is in electric cars, where China's now the world's leading producer of electric cars. They produce over half of all electric cars in the world now. Uh, it will be three quarters soon. Um, they have 400 plus electric car makers, which is quite impressive. Um, they all have really cool logos and hood ornaments, which is the good thing. Why do they have so many? Because of government money. As Dr. Hamry said, state-led capitalism uh, has led to hundreds of billions of Chinese dollars being put into their electric car industry, leading to far too many uh, car companies, far too many cars, overcapacity, making it impossible for others to compete, leading to uh, volatility in the prices of inputs into uh, the items that go into car batteries. Uh, this is going to create havoc for, for many. Uh, if you make a battery, like if you're Samsung or LG, you can't sell in the China market easily because of Chinese industrial policy. Um, so, and given China's scale, uh, this matters for everyone. If China were the size of Peru uh, or Kenya, it wouldn't matter. But China, at its scale, everything it does has global impact. Um, secondly, let's look at values. Um, I want to give you a very uh, small window into a very big picture. Uh, I published an article in Foreign Policy last month uh, that looked at uh, the credit ratings issued by a Chinese credit rating company no one has ever heard of, called Da Gong. Uh, and this is their credit ratings for the 90 countries they follow, the sovereign credit ratings. And that's a very interesting map. Uh, you'll see they're too nervous to, to rate Korea uh, or North Korea. Uh, this is Moody's. This is Moody's map of the same countries, uh, and it's different. Actually, this is, this is the difference between Moody's and Da Gong. And there's a pattern here. Uh, the Chinese rating agency rates authoritarian countries systematically higher than democracies. So in a world that was governed by Chinese values, democracies would pay a price. I've calculated just in a very small way what the price would be for democracies in a Chinese-led world of risk management in international finance. And uh, we'd all pay several hundred billion more each year in interest payments if we were democracies. Now, this is just a small example, a tangible example, of the type of challenge that we have uh, because of our uh, different values. So that leads us to the question, you know, how are we going to respond to this China challenge? And I think Dr. Hamry outlined some of these, but I've tried to put these in a uh, simple two-by-two two way to think about. Uh, the first is the strategy which the U.S. and others have used for many years, engagement, where we've tried to cooperate with China patiently through institutional means. Uh, the U.S. has given up on that strategy and jumped from the first quadrant in the upper left to the bottom right to a policy of confrontation where we're seeking to decouple and contain China. Uh, that's what the Trump administration's approach is like. Now, the al alternative to the current Trump administration is not simply just to go back to engagement where we were before. I think that's really unlikely. Uh, the most likely alternative is the top right quadrant three where it's more of an ideological competition along these issues of values and where the U.S. is collaborating with friends and allies around the world, uh, including with Korea. You can see in the Democratic Party, that's the main con contours of the conversation that were there. Uh, the challenge is how do you get from one place to another? Uh, we know how we got from engagement to confrontation. Uh, the president turned on a dime. 
But how are we going to get from a policy of confrontation that we have now to an alternative? And should that be our ultimate goal? And I think this is one of the biggest debates in the United States is should we view this confrontation with China as unending and inevitable lasting for decades? Or will we be able to f follow a pathway back towards cooperation? And what's that going to require in terms of our alliance relationships? What are the type of conditions we're going to put in front of China? What are the prospects of China moving in that direction? That's really the debate of, of thinking about how do we, what are our strategic alternatives and what are the pathways from one to the other? Now, as I, as I mentioned, the, and I'm sorry to take the time, but I'm just trying to lay some things out here for, to provoke conversation, uh, is this is not easy. Uh, if, if China uh, wasn't engaged with the world economically, uh, we, we really wouldn't have this puzzle. Uh, it'd be pretty straightforward what we'd need to do. Uh, but we are deeply engaged. Um, we have tens of thousands of American companies in China. The same for Korea. 20% of Korea's external trade is with China. Uh, when China's economy gets the flu, Korean economy gets a cold, American economy gets the sniffles. Uh, and the possibility of future opportunities with an economy growing 6% or even 5 or 4% of that size is pretty amazing. And China is deeply part of global supply chains. So just uh, giving this up uh, isn't, isn't easy. In addition, China can be helpful, potentially, in addressing other strategic challenges, uh, including North Korea, uh, but others. Uh, if you think of climate change as a strategic challenge, uh, China's involvement is necessary. Finally, uh, China's weaknesses and strengths, I think, make us need to think about a more complex strategy than just simply confrontation across the board as long as we can think. Uh, China's got a variety of weaknesses that people don't think about. Yes, it's a high-tech power, uh, but not across the board. Uh, China can't build a successful commercial aircraft. Uh, they've tried. They're spending hundreds of billions, even more than they're spending on electric cars. Uh, the commercial aircraft company of China based in Shanghai, is the main leader of this project. Uh, and they're doing a horrible job. These planes will never compete with Boeing and Airbus or others. Uh, the technology is too complicated. The systems integration is too complicated. China's state-owned enterprises are cons constituted to do this. So there's some areas of technology where the Chinese are behind and they're not catching up. And, and in some places, like in semiconductors, where they are making some progress, we're still running faster than the Chinese in most areas. Areas where the Chinese are doing well, I think is also important to see. Like in uh, e-commerce, uh, in some areas of biopharma. What I'm amazed by are the nature of these companies. And I'll just talk about the company on the right. A little company I ran into in Shanghai, and this is just a typical story. Uh, so I, I was starting to talk to the head of research for this company, and I, uh, I said, I used to teach at Indiana University. And she said, oh, I used to live in Indianapolis. I worked at Eli Lilly. Uh, my daughter, we used to go down each weekend to Bloomington for her music lessons at IU. I thought, that's interesting. I never heard that when I went to Comac to talk to them about aircraft. Um, and then... Um, she mentioned that they have funding from Sequoia. And I thought, wow. And they have an office in Bethesda, Maryland, right across the street from the US FDA. They have a pipeline of drugs that looks just like an American pharma company. Uh, this is China's private sector. Uh, now, they aren't gonna they're not going to make China a democracy or liberal, but they're not the same as state-owned sector. And there's many ways in which we can collaborate uh, with them, eyes wide open of course. So that's what makes things uh, challenging. So I just wanted to uh, reaffirm what Dr. Hamry said about the importance of our relationship. It goes beyond a, a simple challenge facing us across the 38th parallel. It's about the global challenges we face about what kind of world we want and what kind of world we will only get uh, if we build it together. Thank you. Thank you. 
Actually, I have many questions. Uh, let me start from today's summit meeting between the, our President Moon Jae-in and uh, uh, US President Donald Trump in New York several hours ago. And I was watching TV this morning to ask, um, you know, to find out what, uh, what happened at the summit meeting. And of course, there wasn't a, enough long story, but one news line was like that. When uh, President Trump was asked whether um, he's going to ease, ease the sanctions uh, before the denuclearization, full commitment from North Korea, he did not deny. So we sense there is a kind of a change because up to now, the American government had a very solid position that uh, they are not going to ease sanctions unless North Korea came up with, come up with more uh, promising um, the deals. And as we know, at the, 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 um, the Hanoi summit meeting that took place at the end of February, President Trump walked away because he couldn't get the satisfactory deal. Uh, and uh, the American side has asked Yongbyon plus ARPA However, uh, as uh, uh, Secretary Pompeo has mentioned at the time, North Korea has another missile and nuclear facility, and uh, North Korea did not make a list of uh, some missile and nuclear warheads. So uh, we are all curious. And, and also, he f recently fired uh, John Bolton, uh, who was accused by North Korea for the failure of a Hanoi summit. So all these changes are kind of hinting that uh, in the next coming uh, summit between President Trump and Kim Jong-un, there will be some uh, new approach, maybe possible deal uh, in between the full sanction and full uh, denuclearizations. Uh, what do you think on this? Trump is just completely unpredictable. Um, and he doesn't have a, uh, a strategic consciousness about things. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, North Korea during the last two months has launched uh, over eight missiles, you know, and, you know, the President Trump basically says, well, they do that all the time, we don't care. Well, they're all in violation of, of the UN resolution. All of these missiles could attack and hit our allies. <clears throat> but he's, just, he's basically implying because they can't reach the United States, it doesn't matter. Now, I think this is really wrong. And I think, I think most, I think a lot of members of Congress would, would believe it's wrong as well. <clears throat> So if the president does want to lift sanctions on North Korea without any real you know, performance on the part of the North Koreans, I think there would be resistance from the Congress to the point that would restrict him. Because I don't think that there's any agreement with him that North Korea's behavior doesn't matter. You know, I think that, that that is going to be the dividing line. Now, I will, I will say that I, um, Republicans in the Congress are not courageous in confronting Trump. But they have been, they have pushed back on foreign policy issues. Um, you know, the president and the White House has lost control of Russia policy. I mean, that's now done in the Congress. I think that's going to probably happen in the Middle East. I think it would happen on Korea if he were to propose lifting sanctions without any benefit, without the North Koreans doing anything. So I think it would trigger a real pushback in the United States if he were to do that. Okay, there is uh, actually additional two questions. Please. I mean. the, personally, <laughs> what kind of uh, <clears throat> plus ARPA you think is sufficient to persuade uh, the, the Congress that, that your, your president can compromise a little bit on this issue because North Korea is not willing to take 
the full sanctions, uh, and they want to kind of uh, provide. Uh, they are not going to provide all the lists America is asking. So there must be somewhere some compromise, and I guess our government is uh, actually wishing the the. President Trump can ease a little bit so they can start the kind of economic cooperation project with North Korea. That's the first one. And second one is, uh, actually many of here are predicting uh, you know, uh, facing next uh, election in USA. Uh, President Trump is willing to uh, compromise a little bit um, on the full denuclearization because he needs a deal and he needs a success with the uh, talk with North Korea, Kim Jong-un. Uh, but uh, some will say that North Korea is not that important issue in uh, presidential campaigns in US elections. So uh, how big the North Korean success story is necessary for uh, Mr. Trump in the coming election? Well, I, you know, I think President Trump wants to get the Nobel Peace Prize. And I think he feels that if he brings um, peace to North Korea, he'll get the Nobel Peace Prize. You know, the, the problem is he just wants to say he's brought peace. The fact that North Korea continues to launch missiles, he ignores it. You know, it, it's pretty hard for me to understand how he or anyone would conclude that North Korea is being, has, is being a peaceful country just because they're only launching short-range missiles, not long-range missiles. So I, I, I don't, I, it, I find it's all very peculiar. I, again, I don't think that he can, I think he would confront opposition if he tried to reduce sanctions. What I do worry about is that he will try to pull troops out of Korea. Uh, and I'm worried that the coming over here and demanding $5 billion was the first step in a campaign to justify pulling troops out of Korea. And here I do worry that th there are going to be Americans that would, would agree with it. I don't. I think it would be a serious mistake. But I do think that there are a large number of Americans that feel we've been there a long time, Korea's a strong and prosperous country, they can defend themselves, we can pull out of Korea. I think people who feel that do not understand the larger geopolitical uh, factors that play out. That this isn't about North Korea, it's about China. You know, it, so pulling out would be catastrophic, but I think the president, with his desire for the Nobel Peace Prize, is could do some some unfortunate things, and I and I worry about that. And um, would the Congress push back on sanctions? Uh, if he just unilaterally said we're going to pull off sanctions, yes, they would pull out. Is there a path forward? I think there is. I think it's going to be, and I think Steve Began has identified, you know, a step-by-step confidence-building process. But it doesn't start with relieving sanctions now. It starts with the North Koreans earning that by taking some concrete steps. They won't even d disclose all of their nuclear complex. You know, so we've got a long ways to go before we have a a country or partner in North Korea that you can trust. And actually, in Seoul, uh, I guess uh, the America and South Korean side uh, start to talk about the burden sharing of USFK. And uh, as we all know, um, last year for this year's burden sharing, um, the both parties concluded to increase 8.6% of a Korean contribution to operation of United States forces in Korea. And, and today, from today, they're going to discuss, negotiate for the next year's uh, increase. And um, I'm, I believe uh, the American side is asking, like, uh, 
at least doubling, and some people <laughs> that increasing five times more. Of course, that is not acceptable. So uh, this kind of talk is uh, pushing um, the contribution from South Korea to the alliance, to keeping USFK is, uh, is very uh, interesting. Um, among Koreans, there are two thinkings. Um, President Trump is uh, pushing South Korea to pay more because of his transaction approach. So it is kind of tactic. So while keeping the, their soldiers here, he wants to compensate it. And second thought is that he's really a uh, minute because if we see his speech uh, on and on, he really want the American soldiers return home. So I guess you believe the second thought, according to your lecture and what you are saying previously, mm -hmm. then I'm wondering why the alliance with South Korea has been devalued so much to Washington. Not only Mr. Trump and also some people in Washington. And it's a very uh, opposite direction. If we look at the Indo-Pacific strategy report came out at the end of May, the alliance with Japan is very, very important. Alliance with Japan and India and Australia in America's Indo-Pacific strategy, that is a kind of reaction to China, even though it maybe it's not containment, but it's very serious uh, kind of approach. So do you think the, the alliance with South Korea has been devalued because of uh, South Korea's ambiguous position on China? Well, I, um, this is exactly why I wanted to come to today, is why I wanted to come to Korea, is to say um, there are Americans that don't think the alliances is important anymore. I don't agree with that. I think that's profoundly wrong. I think, I think peace and stability and prosperity in Northeast Asia entirely depends on Korea and our alliance with Korea. And I don't think enough Americans are thinking about it this way. I think they think about it just in terms of North-South. You know, and when the president says, I brought peace to, to Korea, you know, there are a lot of people that don't care about the details and they just believe him. You know, but that's not the reality of why we're here. The reality is, is that, you know, Korea is the champion of democratic values on the Asian continent. And, and so, have we intentionally devalued the Korea alliance? No. It's that we've stopped thinking about it. That's, I think, the real issue. And the reason I wanted to come and what I'm going to do when I get home is to try to make people think about it. Because I think it's more important than ever. And, uh, and I am worried that there is a, a drift in consciousness about this alliance. And we have to, we have to fight it. I appreciate your conviction that this, the ally, allying with South Korea is critical to U.S. interest in the region and also uh, to keep the liberal international order in this region. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, South Korean government's position, whether it's a liberal government or conservative government, our position uh, in the U.S. China rivalry has been a little bit ambiguous. It's natural because you know, we are so much tied to China economically while we are a very strong ally to USA. So uh, you know, the South Korea didn't enter, for example, Quad, uh, the quadrilateral cooperation network, USA, India, and Australia, and Japan network. Uh, and also, South Korea has been uh, very cautious um, not to be misunderstood by China that uh, South Korea is entering any uh, multilateral efforts to contain China. Uh, so for that matter, it was a very difficult position for South Korea. 
But if we look at the poll, I like to say the um, uh, South Korean's view of USA uh, is very, very good in terms of uh, the their favorability and trustworthiness and accountability. Uh, most Koreans support and think America is a good country, is the most important country to uh, partner with. On the other hand, surprisingly, the Koreans' view of China has been declined seriously after this, uh, the economic retaliation uh, during the, the uh, deployment of Assad in t from the 2016. So if you look at the poll, uh, the Korean views of China is pretty bad, okay? So maybe, th Dr. Kennedy, uh, you like to uh, see uh, in how the, uh, you like to comment how the America is, is uh, interpreting the Korean position in the rising rivalry between USA and China. I think the, uh, American public, their opinions about China have gone in the same direction. Um, if you look at the Chicago Council on Foreign Relations survey or Pew, their surveys, uh, Americans' unfavorability ratings of China are at all times high, even higher than in 1989. Um, and I think that's a consequence of the growing tensions between the two and the not necessarily agreement with, with President Trump on his strategy of how he's dealing with it, but the concerns that have been raised, which I think are shared across uh, the political spectrum in the United States. And I think uh, they're mirrored here. Um, and I'm sure uh, in, in my conversation with companies from Korea when I'm here or when I'm in China or when they visit us at CSIS in Washington, you hear the exact same concerns that American companies have. Uh, Korean companies want to operate in a fair, transparent market with a level playing field where IP is protected, where there's rule of law. Uh, South Korea has a very high value added economy where knowledge and IP are central to growth uh, based on a very strong educational system and um, high tech, I mean, it's one of the most wired countries in the world. Um, and China is moving into these spaces and competing. And I think for both the U.S. and Korea, um, we're actually fine if China succeeds. And often the Ch Chinese say, well, you don't want us to succeed. Actually, it's just about how you go about it and how you compete. Co Americans love competition. Uh, I think in Korea you love competition, but you want a fair competition. You don't want someone starting ahead of you on the starting line. You want them or, or them to tie your shoes and cheat. Um, and so I, I think we have the same types of concerns. Um, of course, uh, as I mentioned, you know, 20% of Korea's trade is with China. That doesn't even begin to really say how closely integrated the two economies are. Some of the same challenges in, in Taiwan is where well, 40% of their econ trade is with, with mainland China. Um, and so that makes the choice seem harder. And I, often I hear uh, when I'm in Asia or in Europe, the U.S. is forcing us to choose. You're forcing us to choose. Don't force us to choose. Well, I think, uh, uh, just to reemphasize what Dr. Hamry said, the choice is not the U.S. or China. The choice is which order do you want? Do you want the liberal international order, markets, transparency, rule of law, or do you want an illiberal order that devalues those things? In the short term, maybe you can make more money uh, uh, by uh, having some special deals and privileges, but over the longer term, we know the record historically in looking at economic development around the world, including in this region, is that the more marketized and more open you are, the more successful you're going to be. So even if there's some benefits for some specific sectors or companies that don't care about what type of order we have, I think in, in South, the U.S. and South Korea s share the same common national interest in having a global order which is more supportive of our, of our values. It just so happens that those values also are to our benefit uh, for our economies and our societies as well. I would, I would just like to add something. I think everything Scott said I agree with. Um, there are some Americans and some members of the administration that don't like Korea and the Moon government because it's not anti-China. 
I think that's really, you know, again, quite wrong way to think about this. Um, this is, you know, this is not about a Cold War. This is about competition. And when it comes down to competition, the most important thing is how do you improve yourself so you can compete better? It isn't how do I destroy the other guy. That's what war is. But if it's competition, it's how do I improve myself? And frankly, America has got a lot of flaws right now. And we, we need to be spending far more time fixing ourselves so that we are more competitive. I mean, the American model in the world is tarnished. And I think we have to spend a lot of effort to try to get better. So this is a competition. This is not a Cold War. This is a competition, and it really depends on how we improve ourselves. I think, you know, when it comes to Korea, you know, we have to understand, you, you cannot have hostile attitude towards China. It's just not possible. Nobody in Asia can afford to have hostile relations with China. Um, that doesn't mean that you are weak or indecisive or not committed to our values. It's that you have to have a survival strategy. You know, and I think we have to understand that. I think that the Korean government has been careful to make sure that they do have constructive relations with Russia, I, with China. I don't think that means that Korea is weak or not a worthy ally. I think it means they have probably a more sophisticated approach than we do. So in my view, we have to fix ourselves. Mm -hmm. If we're going to compete against China, this is a really a tough competitor. We have to improve our game. Okay, L let me follow because it's a very important point. If it's all about economic competition between USA and China, how would you uh, persuade many poor Asian countries that China would be an ally with the cheaper and with no conditionality for a aid from China side and America? Uh, is not a good uh, the resource provider to uh, to Asia, which need to build up many infrastructure facilities. Uh, so in this uh, competitions, you know, just uh, talking about value is not sufficient to persuade many Asian developing countries uh, to uh, line up for the better uh, rule based or fairer competition, unlike state capitalism, unfair competition from China side. Okay, all right, now, now we're in my ballpark here. All right, let me go back to the first part, and I'll, I'll answer the second. Um, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, I think it uh, was a great idea when it was born. Um, the U.S. really stole defeat from the jaws of victory on that. It's critical not only for economics but for national security. Uh, developing a common set of rules, higher bar than the WTO, filling in major gaps in the international governance related to data, investment, state-owned enterprises. Uh, we, we dropped the ball on that. Um, now, I understand that Korea was not original signatory, but I still think it's, if, if I were, South Korea, I'd be telling Washington, you need to be back in TPP. Um, I know that in Taiwan, they were not part of TPP. And they said, well, we'd like to be a part of it. Actually, having the US in TPP is more important than having anyone in TPP. And then you can expand it. And I think as soon as, so finding a way to get the US back in and letting everyone know how important that is, and then having others join before China joins, I think is, is, is really important. Um, and then you'll see TPP be a model that's expanded beyond the region and it will be uh, potentially built on top of the WTO globally. I think that's one thing that we have to do in terms of aid and development assistance. Um, I think it's, it's actually not a hard sell. Um, if you look what China is doing along the Belt and Road with China Development Bank, other types of, of challenges, we've been following this at CSIS very closely with our Reconnecting Asia program. Uh, some of the cases where uh, they've lent way too much money for bad projects, creating debt traps. That doesn't occur in every instance, but includes, inc occurs in plenty. The Chinese are 
not very efficient at home when they invest, and they're not any more efficient when they go abroad. Um, and they aren't as any more careful at home about civil society. When they go abroad, that's the same thing. So uh, I think societies want to develop in a constructive, successful manner. They don't have the type of bottomless pit of resources that the Chinese have. Uh, they also have to be accountable to their citizens. And I think the U.S. has already outlined a strategy of collaborating with Japan, uh, India, and others to offer an alternative. This is one of the areas of the free and open Indo-Pacific where they have an actual plank where they want to put money behind it, not just government money, but private sector money. Um, you're never going to hand out cash at the scale the Chinese are, but you don't need to do that. And I think to successfully compete doesn't mean competing on China's terms, it means competing on our terms. You know, I, we, pre, we quite regularly have visiting heads of state that come and give a talk at CSIS. Uh, we had an African president that was with us last year. We were talking in advance about this, and he says, you know, uh, you Americans give me lectures and the Chinese give me money. You know, and there's, sadly, there's truth in that. Um, it, it, we we have fallen in a pattern in recent years of lecturing everybody. You know, and not being helpful. And uh, I I think again, this is part of what we have to get back. We're in a great competition. This is a big competition, and it means we've got to improve our own performance. And it means we spend a lot less time lecturing people about how wonderful we are. You know, that turns people off. You know, let's spend more time trying to say, how do we help you with your problem? You know, the, the, the Chinese are not giving anything away. Everything they're doing is going to come back in a very rapacious way for them. So nobody's going to benefit in the long run with the way the Chinese invest. But we have to do a better job of stop giving lectures and telling everybody how wonderful we are and why you want to be with us. We've got to perform better. Yes, I guess uh, the American approach to FOIP, free and open Indo-Pacific um, strategy is uh, using private sector, right? So you encourage your energy industries to invest uh, in uh, Asia so I, I think for that approach, uh, Japanese is also a good partner. So you create a fund together and try to support Asian countries for that matter. Um, however, uh, considering um, the recent uh, Korea-Japan relations, it's very bad, frankly speaking. Yes. Uh, cannot be worse, actually. Um, so from the American perspective, why these two allies who are championing the liberal democracy are fighting each other rather than cooperating for the peace and prosperity of the Asian region. And then the, uh, for some Koreans, and, you know, we had a history issues with Japan. In the past, the American president tried to um, mediate uh, it's not just, uh, it's more like a soft engagement, a kind of nudge leadership to ease the tension between uh, two leaders of Korea and, and Japan, as President Obama has done when the uh, previous uh, Park Geun-hye president and also Prime Minister Abe had a difficulty. Uh, the, you know, President Obama kind of uh, created a setting for three leaders together. but. Up to now, the President Trump hasn't taken this kind of mediating leadership over this conflict between two, uh, two governments. And, and, uh, and I guess history issue was uh, kind of uh, pushed by Prime Minister Abe, uh, like a linking history issue to the trade issues. So it's kind of... Uh, retaliating by economic means. And then a uh, South Korean government uh, decided not to renew GSOMIA, General Information, uh, Military Information Agreement. So now the fighting is expanded to the security area. 
So that's uh, quite pity uh, for uh, to 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 uh, observe, and uh, how the the Washington D.C. Uh, uh, is looking at this situation. You know, I uh, I understand the history issues, and it's a bitter history, just awful. Um, but you know, America can't can't survive without having both Korea and Japan as allies. And I think we have failed. You know, the administration has failed by not trying to help bridge across this. Uh, it's because again, we're not thinking about this in a strategic way. Uh, you know, my my issue when I have conversations with Japanese friends and Korean friends, it's always, let's think about the next 30 years. How does, a ten, how does tension and conflict between Korea and Japan help you over the next 30 years survive? I, this is what we have to start thinking about. And we Americans have to be far more engaged in helping with this. Because I understand the history issues. I really do. As I said, I have a Korean godson. and. Uh, you know, so, and I don't minimize any of that. But we have to make sure the next 30 years are survivable and that we can all prosper together. And I, and I don't think we're going to get there by having this tension get tighter and more complicated and angrier. It's already as bad as I've ever seen it in my lifetime. And, I, and I'm quite worried about it. It... it uh, you know, normally politicians don't try to tie their own hands. But both, both governments have tied their hands where it's very hard for them to move now. And I think we have to find a way forward. And I wish, I, I wish America was playing a more active and constructive role. And Dr. Kennedy, do you have a specific idea about how to get out of this quagmire? <laughs> I, I wish I did. Uh, I, this is a fundamental issue of reconciliation from some of the darkest tragedies of the 20th century. Um, there is no easy answer. Um, uh, it requires uh, amazing leadership at the national level, at, among civil society, um, and um, I, I I think the U.S. can try to, as you said, nudge, provide encouragement, explain the, the value of, of finding reconciliation because of the needs for the future. But uh, precisely how that's going to be, this is going to be addressed, um, and people feel that they're valued and respected and honored. Um, uh, that's going to happen here in Asia. Um, we, we can encourage it as much as we want, but uh, we can't provide the, the ultimate solution. And Dr. Hemme, um, how do you see the, the trade war between USA and China is going to evolve? And some people predict, and that's going to uh, hurt American economy as well. And, and, and they say there is already kind of symptom that uh, America cannot maintain the current growth rate. Uh, and uh, that will kind of a, be a quite big worry for mm -hmm. uh, President Trump. And, and also there is also the 5A issues and uh, 5G uh, technology issues. And even the Europeans uh, kind of uh, divided on this issue. Now, technology-wise, uh, there is a kind of uh, uh, decoupling issues. So other countries ha have to choose either the, uh, the American side or the China's uh, the advanced technology, because it's much cheaper, right, <laughs> to set up. Um, how, do you think it will just uh, gone or just uh, either stop in maybe probably early next year? Because it's some people who believe in market as a very rational allocating principle mm -hmm. cannot be this this trade war cannot be sustained 
uh, because market rationality will prevail at some point. So how do you see the, the prospect of the trade issues between two giants? Yeah. I'm, 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 I, Dr. Kennedy really is an expert here. I'll, I'll just say a little bit and then I'd like to turn to him. Um, you know, American attitudes about China have changed profoundly in the last five years. Um, five years ago, I think that you know it was still the it was kind of the prevailing view that while China was you know getting you know scratchy in our relations, they were still on a path of uh, you know kind of convergence against Western values. I think that was the view in China uh, about China and the United States. Uh, that's profoundly changed now, and uh, there it's. The, the, the view now is China is a, an aggressive and, and maybe even a malevolent competitor. And the debate is only about how do we compete against China. Uh, so there is support in the, in the United States for President Trump for starting the trade war. I think there's also a view that there's no strategy. You know, that he's, he started a confrontation, but he doesn't know how to, how to win. And <clears throat> I think the, the now I, I do talk to some friends that say they think there might be a deal that's coming. Uh, but I, I, the, I think the jury's out. I'm less confident that that'll happen. But Scott, why don't I turn to you? This is more your area. Um, I think I agree with you um, across the board. Um, There's, there's definitely uh, a meme in the United States that letting China into the WTO was a mistake and that uh, it was a fool's errand to think that integration economically would lead China to temper its authoritarianism at home or its activities abroad. Now, I think actually we made a bunch of progress uh, by engaging, by establishing diplomatic relations in the late 70s by others establishing diplomatic ties, including Korea in the early 90s, um, and that China's international behavior was tempered and improved. They're not uh, the proliferators they used to be. Uh, they, are a, uh, they were, for a long time, a more benign influence. Um, but I really see the turning point as under Xi Jinping in the last six years. Um, not night and day, but significant enough change, much greater role of the party, much greater control at home. Uh, look at Xinjiang, look at uh, the rise of the social credit system, the role of the party in companies, um, look at the confrontation with Hong Kong. Um, you know, um, these, these are all big challenges and China doesn't say any longer that it's economy in transition. They say this is a system, we're just perfecting it. Um, and so, um, the, the question, uh, given that, um, we, we have to, we're debating what the uh, appropriate approach would be, you know, uh, we can have a debate over whether the trade war is going to end or not, and I'll say something about that in a second, but we have to have that conversation inside the context of a broader strategy. And if we went back to the boxes that I put up there, the, the two by two, if we're just having, a, if it's just what we're doing now, which is an arm wrestling match about power, it's when will the f one side say uncle and get more of the spoils than the other. But that's not what this competition should be about. It's a, it should be about much more. I think that upper right, where we're really talking, putting this in the context of our broader values and systems is the way to think about it. And then, but not being satisfied seeing this as an unending competition and conflict, but trying to figure out how we get back to a path of where we can encourage and nudge and push the Chinese to ex see that integration is not um, a death sentence for the Communist Party or for China. I, I, I go to China all the time and I'm amazed. China is richer, safer, healthier than it's ever been. And they are more fearful than they've ever been. I think they're partly fearful because of the way we talk about them and the way we interact. And I think we can try and provide some type of reassurance to make them feel that integration uh, will actually be in their interests. In the sh short term, the trade war, uh, again, as, as Dr. Hamry said, uh, the president's very unpredictable. Um, and he could say that for the purposes of an election, he wants a deal. 
Uh, or he can make an argument that he doesn't need a deal, that he can run as the tough one on China. Um, I guess where I come down on this uh, is, is that the president is more an actor in this drama than the director, and that it takes two sides to make a deal. And I don't think the Chinese want a deal because they don't trust him. They think today will shake, tomorrow you'll break your word, and you'll move the goalposts, you'll put up additional demands, and the Chinese don't want to face that. So I think that it, China has essentially decided, except for maybe the most super, superficial deal, they're going to wait to see what happens um, with regard to whether the president wins a second term or the next administration. Not because they think the Democrats are easier, but because they just don't trust uh, President Trump. And I was reading some European um, strategy to this rising competition between USA and China. I guess Europeans are trying to use their regulatory power, like uh, their, uh, you know, how they can uh, use the general norms and the rules when they uh, uh, use the procurement uh, role. So when they buy Chinese goods and services, they're going to apply the European uh, norms. Uh, and also, uh, I know the, on FIA, the European countries are divided, right? Uh, except uh, Germany and France. Um, even UK is very ambiguous about whether they're going to take the 5G or not. And uh, other, especially the Eastern European countries, are kind of willing to uh, take the Chinese technology uh, and also Chinese investment a lot. So um, for this coming competition between two giants, technology must be very, very important. Uh, and I am getting many questions from the floor. Uh, so let's just uh, relate it to this ongoing discussion. Um, Mr. Chen Min Zheng has asked, in the, um, in the U.S.-China uh, uh, competition, um, there must be a role from the other partners of USA, like uh, Japan can do something and Australia can do something. And what would be the, uh, the South Korea's uh, niche or contribution uh, to uh, to uh, to the to ease the tension in um, the the U.S. and China technology and trade competition, and another question is also related to technology, and uh, that's uh, whether um, America has uh, prepared uh, to invest a lot of R and D to catch up with the uh, Chinese technology. Uh, because you have a different uh, strategy, like uh, China is a more state-centered uh, technology strategy. On the other hand, you have a private sector, Silicon Valley, and all this market-driven um, uh, strategy. And uh, how would you react to these two questions? Uh, let me do the first one, you do the second. You know, cause I, you know, I think, what is Korea's role? Well. This gets to a larger question in my mind, and, and that is, uh, I think Korea under uh, undersells itself as a as a leading country. I think the division of Korea has caused your own self confidence and imagination to be limited. I mean, there's no country in the world that has been more successful than Korea over the last 60 years, and yet I think. You talk to Koreans and they feel vulnerable. They feel like they're falling behind. Mm -hmm. They feel like they are uh, things are falling apart. You know, I and I can say why this is such a successful society, such a successful country. I think this is where we have to end the division of Korea because I think the division of Korea has caused Koreans to underestimate themselves mm -hmm. and to have a, uh, a kind of an inferiority complex about themselves. It's such a successful place. So what can Korea do? Well, first of all, be confident in what you are. I mean, I, I think it's a great thing that Korea is so successful. And the Korean companies are so successful. I mean, my wife, she loves her Samsung phone. You know, I mean, <laughs> you know, this is just, it, but, but it doesn't translate into confidence as a nation.
And so I think you should be playing a larger role on issues in the world, not just go to the international institutions to defend Korea or advance Korean interests. Take a role in the larger issues that are challenging the world right now. And you have such a strong foundation for doing that. And I, that's what I would ask you to do. And we're going to be together. You know, I'm not, I'm not worried that we'll stay together uh, because ultimately, you know, we're quite bound together in wanting to see prosperity for our families, our grandkids, safety and peace in our societies. You know, we see the world the same way. So I'm, I'm, I think we can make this, but we just have to look at the larger picture here. Why don't you talk about that? Sure. Um, uh, just to piggyback on, on, on what John has said and the, this question about R&D, um, Chinese government spends more than any government in R&D, but the U.S. is still the world's leader in R&D because of our private sector, because of our universities. Um, if you look at any innovation index uh, that's transnational, the U.S. and Korea rank ahead of China. Um, it's something I'd encourage everyone to go look at the global innovation index um, and you can see that the Chinese are catching up uh, but they're still behind. Um, and that lead that we've had for 40 years uh, is extremely important and uh, it's a huge foundation in which we ought to have a, a great deal of confidence as, as John said. I think in terms of things that we can do um, together I think um, trusted supply chains are extremely important. Um, people are very worried about uh, not only the technology from Huawei, not to some extent it's the hardware, but it's actually more the software. Um, and think of other Chinese companies or those that manufacture in China sometimes, can you be sure? And I think now we're more concerned about the technology that's in supply chains uh, than ever before because we are interconnected. As soon as you plug in your laptop in my home in Falls Church, Virginia, you're immediately connected to somebody uh, here in, in Seoul uh, in the way that we didn't have that type of deep integration when we we're uh, trading in toys and clothing and even, even cars. Um, if you think about autonomous vehicles and those being connected to the road and to everyone, that type of deep interconnectedness means that trust is far more important than it's ever been before and South Korea uh, can play a critical role in, in developing trusted systems. In addition to that, uh, as John alluded to, there's some 21st, other 21st century challenges that we need uh, Korea's leadership on. You think about how automation is changing the nature of work. You think about how AI is changing the way that we interact uh, as consumers in all spheres of life in the provision of health care, uh, in how our data is collected and stored, um, uh, how we interface with the planet uh, because of changes in climate, uh, how all of this is affecting not our morals but our value, our, the norms that we need to implement all of these in a smart way. Um, I think given our shared values, uh, Korea can contribute a lot to coming up with new global norms uh, for the issues of the 21st century. And so as much as we need to worry about this arm wrestling match with China over who gets how much of the pie, uh, we also have to worry as much or even more about these kinds of very complex issues. Um, and I, I'm sure that if, if we come back uh, in 10 years or 20 years to repeat this conversation, we'll be talking about public policy issues we didn't think of because the technology is going to run far ahead of, of what we can think of. And those are the, the areas in which uh, South Korea can provide leadership. Uh, well, you know, Dr. Kennedy, uh, about this Chinese uh, leadership in the AI technology, uh, I think your estimation is too, how can I say, uh, too little. <laughs> well, many of us believe China has already caught up with uh, America in certain sectors of uh, this uh, AI technology and first industrial revolution. So what will? Uh, yeah. Um, I, I, we, we're, um, on uh, next Monday, we're publishing a report on China and AI. So, and you can watch it live. Uh, you might have to get up a little bit early 
to watch it, uh, but you can watch it. I think it's at, it's at 1 p.m. in Washington, so midnight here. So if you if you have a difficult time falling asleep, uh, you can you can watch live or you can watch it recorded. Um, and and my colleagues are issuing this report. And I think what they're saying is is yes, in 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 academic research, the number of papers, citations. Uh, some types of business applications of AI uh, uh, that are consumer-facing, the Chinese are uh, moving ahead uh, and doing things that you, we don't do in the U.S. For example, with fintech, we're still uh, dependent on our credit cards and cash, where the Chinese never see it, actually any cash or credit cards anymore. Um, but in the mo more advanced areas of, of AI, applications to healthcare, to uh, thinking about autonomous vehicles and transportation, um, about the theoretical underlying pins, uh, un underlying elements of neural networks, the biggest, you know, the sort of the core foundations of, of AI. Uh, the U.S. Uh, is still at the front. And actually, AI research is global. Uh, no one is going to do it by themselves. And so if, if uh, we draw a line down the Pacific or uh, the Chinese withdraw, um, it's going to hurt them. So, yes, we can be worried about China and what they're doing in AI. But this is a global uh, competition and global partnership. But could I just, mm -hmm. because they are such a strong competitor, we have to work harder. Yes. You know, it isn't, it, it, you're not going to cause them to abandon what they're doing because you don't like them. Uh -huh. You know, we've got to work harder. We've got to improve our own game. Mm -hmm. So it's really a message. I mean, this is competition. This isn't war. This is competition. And we have to do a better job improving ourselves. And uh, if I just uh, react a little bit to what Dr. Henry has mentioned, South Korea should be confident because you can do much more. I guess um, um, during the Lee Byung-bak government, we had a global Korea slogan. And at the time, there was a lot of uh, foreign policy uh, meetings talking about middle powermanship of South Korea in regional and global issues. However, what the rising, um, the great power rivalry, especially USA and, and China, and also with the worsening uh, environment uh, from in the peninsula with the uh, North Korea's uh, sophistication of uh, nuclear weapon and missile uh, capabilities. Uh, somehow our foreign policy uh, horizon has been uh, shrunk. Yeah. And I think that's a pity. Uh, and also, if South Korea want to play more bigger role, we have to have a good relations with the neighboring countries, especially with Japan. And that's uh, kind of, uh, so in a sense, we are missing many opportunities. Uh, but nevertheless, South Korea is trying to do more globally uh, through the foreign aid and also human rights promotion in UN-related uh, bodies. Uh, so I, I, I hope we can do more and, and better. <laughs> OK. And uh, there is a question about the coming election in USA. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure, uh, I don't know, you're going to bet for President Trump or any, any strong candidate from the Democratic Party. And anyway, who is going to get elected during the campaign season uh, next year? How South Korea and North Korea issues will be viewed by the campaigners and also American public? Well, first, we are a nonpartisan think tank. We uh, we don't take sides. We don't uh, we don't champion one party or the other, uh, and uh, and we try to be honest and objective about both. Um, I don't think that foreign policy in general is going to have a, a very large profile in the next election. Uh, we tend to be, you know, like every country, preoccupied about our own problems. and So it, I don't think foreign policy will be so large. There is a, a fairly broad concern that President Trump doesn't value allies. I think that's, uh, that, so I think you will hear some of that uh, in in the campaign, that we don't appreciate allies. But I do think you'll also hear people say Trump stood up to China, nobody else would. So I think it's going to be a kind of a complex, uh, but not a very decisive 
uh, discussion. Now, if if the president does say, I want to pull troops out of Korea because I brought peace to the Korean Peninsula, then it'll become an issue. And I think that will cause a big debate. But I think absent that, I think it's going to be about more about domestic issues. Yeah, yeah I think so. Um, I, I'd agree. I do think um, questions of foreign policy usually are seen through a lens of what they mean for voters. So um, if there is, if you're in a war, there's a high prospect for a war, then it will be salient. Um, but I think right now, the main concern um, that Americans have been thinking about is the question of globalization. And, and China is really a metaphor for the strengths and weaknesses of globalization and what it means for jobs in the United States and our, and our values. Um, and in um, previous elections, for the most part, China has not been a big issue because essentially the Republicans and Democrats have had roughly the same approach on China with slightly different flavor. Some kind of engagement with a little more hedging here, a little more hedging there. Uh, President Trump has flipped it, right? He said, no, we're going to be much more confrontational. Um, but the Democrats have kind of flipped along with him. He's pulled the entire political spectrum with him. And so to the extent to which China is part of the campaign, it'll be the president arguing, uh, I finally got tough. And the other side saying, uh, you're tough but stupid and we'll be smarter. Um, and that isn't really an obvious res you know, resonate for folks that it's going to be the fundamental reason why they're going to vote for or against. So I still think it's going to be in the area really more as a metaphor for uh, sort of America's own well-being. And, you know, the president has been highlighting anxieties, right, a, 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 about the U.S. position in the world and about certain segments of America within our own population. I think it's going to be seen more through that sort of lens of values and culture uh, and anxieties as opposed to what are the real issues going on here in East Asia that the U.S. needs to be thinking strategically about. Okay, and next question is about the China's uh, territorial issues with the neighboring countries. And uh, it's my impression that the China is not provoking them much with the uh, maritime or territorial issues recently after trade war with the USA has been a prominent challenge to them. Um, for example, when the, uh, the, the PCA ruled uh, for the South China Sea, the China has no uh, legal uh, claim over this uh, small islets uh, with the neighboring countries. China just ignored, right? And then when 2010, with the Sengaku and Dayo uh, island disputes, that was also big issues, uh, provoking Japan uh, to uh, take a more hardline policy against China. But these days, uh, China is moving uh, to show their muscle uh, in maritime order uh, and so forth. Uh, so how do you see the China's military expansion or military power projection in uh, Asia? Um, well, um, China has more ships with guns and missiles on it than the United States Navy. So they've made major investments in uh, hard power force projection uh, with their coastal patrol boats and with their navy. It's not a, the navy itself is not so impressive but right now, but they are building a lot of capacity. But they, but they have a Coast Guard ship that weighs 10,000 tons. I mean, that's, that's a destroyer, or, I mean, a cruiser. I mean, that's a, so they've made huge investments and, and it's made a difference. I think the, the, the Chinese you know, building islands and militarizing them was one of the most important factors in changing how America views China. 
And I think it has contributed to this huge shift in America that China is now an aggressive, uh, maybe even malevolent competitor. Um, so they made a colossal mistake. And uh, it, it has galvanized and brought us together. The problem is we have not come up with a coherent strategy, you know, to deal with it. And I think finding a way to bring allies together, I think this is where the president's wrong by not understanding the power of allies. I mean, we are the luckiest country in the world to have allies. And then for him to kind of disparage them or to, to you know, uh, be dismissive of allies is a huge mistake. So, uh, we'll, but we'll, we'll, we'll get there. I mean, we're going to, you know, I don't think that, I think most Americans understand how crucial it is to have allies like, like Korea. Okay, uh, other question is about the, uh, the Korean reunifications. Um, I, if I um, uh, check, yeah, yeah, for, for the, the Korean support to have a USFK even after reunification uh, was, uh, I think, one third, and then uh, about slightly over 40% like to see slight reduction if two Koreas are reunified. And then there are only very less than the single digit of South Koreans want the withdrawal mm -hmm. of uh, USFK after the Korean Peninsula is reunified. Um, so I think uh, the public support for the continuous uh, uh, stay of USFK is quite solid, even though there must be some uh, the size uh, adjustment. Um, but one um, uh, that's from the former MP Park Kyung Ha, she said uh, uh, the, uh, her, she heard the in the private speech Hillary Clinton um, has mentioned uh, that the, the America does not support the unification of the two Koreas because unified Korea is just too strong. <laughs> and um, I'm surprised why she said this. Is it true? Because usually that's something we are saying towards Japanese because Japan doesn't want a strong nationalistic unified Korea, uh, you know, having them as a neighbor. But uh, so she likes to check uh, how strong the American support for leadification of the two Koreas? Uh, well, uh, first of all, I, you know, I'm not, I've met Hillary Clinton a number of times. I'm not close to her. Uh, I'd be very surprised if she said that. I don't think that that, uh, I, I really doubt she would say that. <clears throat> uh, I don't think Americans think very much about a unified Korea. I think they should think about it. And I think if they do think about it, they'll realize how absolutely valuable, valuable it is for us. Um, so I'm on a personal campaign, you know, and when, when I became ill and I was told I had only a certain amount of time left, um, this is one thing I'm going to work on for Americans to understand how critical it is for us to help Korea be, become strong. And I think becoming strong means becoming unified. You know, I know there's a huge set of issues about what it means to, to unify. And I know that there are an awful lot of, uh, especially the young people here in Korea, that aren't really that supportive. I mean, life is already tough, you know, and so why make it harder? So I think that there's, there's some work that we need to do here in Korea as well. But if, let's just step back. 30 years from now, do we want Korea to be strong democratic, a champion for free enterprise, a champion for liberty? Well, of course we do. There's no question about that. And so we have to be supportive of it and we have to find a way to help it come, help it come to reality. I think we have only 10 minutes uh, to end the session. And there is a comment by the ambassador from Ukraine uh, saying that uh, uh, why uh, we do not worry that much about chemical weapons of North Korea, mm. because they can be more dangerous 
uh, than uh, the nuclear weapons. Uh, any opinion on this? Well, I, it's a very good question, and I think it's a very fair question, and we should be more concerned. I mean, the North Koreans not only have uh, a nuclear program, they have a chemical weapons program, they have a biological weapons program. Uh, you know, North Korea is still the only country in the world that inoculates people against smallpox. You know, smallpox is eradicated unless you have a weapon. You know, so um, we should be spending a lot more time thinking about what that means. I know that there was a time when our military here in Korea spent a fair amount on uh, preparatory measures for fighting in a chemical warfare environment. Uh, we don't have chemical weapons, we don't, so it isn't us. It was how do we live when they attack us with chemical weapons. So we should, I think the ambassador is right to raise the question, and we should be spending more time thinking about it. Okay, uh, I guess the last question from the floor uh, is about the, uh, the prospect for the next summit between President Trump mm -hmm. and Kim Jong-un. And uh, uh, how do you see the chance uh, of the summit and what would be the kind of uh, major agenda and, and some consensus uh, whether that can be reached um, between two leaders uh, and, and that there, of course is the tension in, in the Korean Peninsula and also that can be played uh, 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 administer the coming election um, cycle in USA. So if you just offer your insights about the next summit, that would be appreciated. Well, I, I, I wish I knew. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know what the new national security advisor will, what his views would be. Uh, you know, I think Josh Bol uh, John Bolton was was very skeptical about uh, some. I don't think he was the only reason that the president pulled back the last time. Um, and in general, I think that the, the 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 American security community is skeptical about an agreement. So I think the president would really have to, you know, to really twist arms to get people not to say that they're that that we should have an agreement without any per performance on the part of North Korea. I mean, North Korea really ha hasn't really done anything. It's been, you know, they, they have not done any real disclosures of their nuclear complex. They've identified old things, you know, but they haven't really uh, been honest about the extent of their program. So um, I think, you know, if the president, the president is going to try to pr project it as being a great victory. I mean, that's what he does. Um, but I do think there's going to be questioning whether there is any substance to it. And uh, as I said, my primary worry is not about an agreement with North Korea. My primary worry is the president is going to somehow say we don't have to have troops in Korea any longer. That would be the big crisis in my mind. I think it's really important that we temper our expectations about uh, what can happen in the next few months or year and a half. Um, I think even if there is some type of agreement or progress, we shouldn't overestimate how much progress it will actually bring. And if there's some setback, I don't think we should be overly concerned that the setbacks will be permanent. Um, I think it's the same thing when we're thinking about trade uh, and ec the economic challenge and the other types of competition we have with China. This is going to be a long-term uh, challenge for us. Um, and so we have to be motivated by our ideals and our values, uh, but realize that achieving them are going to take a lot of patience, uh, a lot of determination, a lot of cooperation uh, with us. Um, I play golf. And there may be a few golfers here. And you know if you want to play golf well, uh, if when you're on the green and you putt and you miss the putt, you shouldn't freak out too much. You shouldn't get too upset. You got to kind of keep calm. If you make the putt, you also shouldn't be too joyous. You kind of got to keep 
your attitude in check because you still have to play. Uh, on the last hole, if you want to be excited, you can. Um, I think we need to see this as a long-term challenge. Uh, so um, be focused on the direction that we want to go in, but um, not get overly uh, excited or um, disappointed in what happens in the short term. Thank you. Uh, I guess uh, today my take is about um, from this uh, discussion is that we really have to think about the future of uh, U.S. rock alliance, uh, thinking about China factor. In May uh, this year, I was just uh, sitting in uh, very top high officials of DOD talking about Indo-Pacific strategy and uh, the U.S. rock alliance has barely mentioned. So I was very much concerned uh, how our ally relationship uh, with the USA has been uh, devalued over time as America is trying to use alliance network uh, thinking about China. So oh, I guess uh, for, the, for the Koreans, we it's a good time to think about whether it be the future of U.S. rock alliance uh, in a more broader terms and um, without confining to peninsula affairs. Anyway, it was great fun and, and honor and, and Dr. Hamney is this very strong support of uh, the future of South Korea as a, a vital and a strong democratic country contributing to the region. It was a good encouragement. And thank you so much for Dr. Hamney and Dr. Kennedy. Thank you very much. Thank you.